It'll be interesting to see if people make the slog in the rain. <laughs> Sometimes when it rains, people are like, eh, I don't know if I'm going to class. I had a student once who told me, I don't go to class if it's raining. I don't go to class if it's snowing. I don't go to class if it's too nice. And I'm like, so when do you go? Like when it's just like a little bit cloudy? <laughs> <laughs> like thanks for the heads up I guess that I'll never see you It is. It's not as bad as it was a little bit ago, but it's not great. Let's put it that way.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I know a couple people ran out to the restroom, but they'll be back. Um, the lovely thing is I know a little of all of you already, so I have to just check you off already. It's nice. I don't have no money in my other classes, and so that's there. So I wanted to take uh, a few more minutes today to look at Blackboard and all the resources available to you here. Um, then we'll go through the first SGA. I have a lot of uh, videos to show various brain scans today, and I wore my brain scan skirt for y'all, so I'm, I'm on trend here. Um, and uh, give you a little vibe for how we'll go over things in class. I looked really quickly through y'all's assignments before I came over. It looked like no one had like pressing questions, which is pretty common for this one. Uh, there's more questions as we go on, but remember, if there's anything that you don't understand or something you really want to make sure I go over, put that in the comments section of uh, where you turn in your SGA and I'll show you that real quick as we go over everything. So again, you can find your syllabus here um, and the first couple chapters of the Augment case study book are here, but thanks to Oliver, there may or may not be something that may or may not violate copyright that you can save a lot of money with right here. Um, so <laughs> big ups to Oliver for helping us find that. Uh, and I didn't post it and yet I did. So, um, <laughs> I could technically get in trouble. I don't know how much I care. I'd rather save y'all money. <laughs> All right. Here, if you can't make it to class, but you would still like to sign in, this is where you can find the Zoom info. It's also on the syllabus if you want to just log in from that link. Uh, I haven't posted any of my recordings for any of my classes yet this semester, um, but I plan to work on that today. So there will be a link up at the top of this page to um, the YouTube playlist for this semester. If anyone's interested in the ones I did in the past, they're up here from the last time I taught. Um, and then here is where you find those study guide assignments. Uh, so if you click into one of them, it will say create submission, upload files, or add comments. So if you want to just copy paste whatever you wrote or just type into here, um, you can do it in create submission. I do have to say just with my past experience of Blackboard, I don't necessarily cr recommend creating it in Blackboard because every once in a while Blackboard will just eat it and then you have to start again. So I would say, save it somewhere on your computer or like in a Google uh, document or something like that and then copy paste it or you can upload a file here. Either of those is fine. And then here is where if there's any particular parts, you can be like, oh, I really struggled with question 2A this time or, uh, write a question about, I didn't understand this part of the brain anatomy. Can we go over that? Then when I'm grading this, those will pop up on the side for me. And those are the things I jot down. And when I come to class, I can go over this. You can obviously ask questions in class too. Um, but that just helps me as I'm getting ready for class each time. And all of them are posted and available for the whole semester. So you can work ahead. You don't have to. Uh, I used to have them disappear and people had a really hard time studying for the exam somehow. Uh, so they don't disappear anymore. <laughs> um, links and videos that I'll show in class will be here. Uh, and so uh, you all will be able to refer to them after class if you need to. Um, exams and quizzes. Ooh, this is something I wanted to make sure I said. Okay, so exams, I'm going to print out and send them home with you, take home, and then you'll bring them back. Uh, quizzes you're going to do on your own, but some at least one person has come to me and said they don't do well on quizzes just on Blackboard. 
So if anyone wants a paper copy of the quiz, I have those two, they're the exact same. Uh, just let me know. Uh, and I can run off copies when the copier has more toner. So right now I've got to email them up to do this. Uh, and then you can do it now. And it's like I said, the exact same thing. But I want to make this course as accessible as possible for all of you. Do you have a question? Okay, just checking. Didn't want to miss you. All righty. Um, your papers and projects will be info posted here throughout the semester. This is where you turn in that short paper. Um, I uploaded, <laughs> not even joking, this is the paper I wrote for this class when I was an undergrad. So feel free to look at all the works and all. Um, <laughs> but you can see I wrote it in 2003, maybe before some of you were born. Um, and I kind of tried to indicate with comments where I got uh, professor comments. Um, and like he said, uh, don't quote, right? Put it in your own words, things along those lines. What's that? It's not a final paper. It's just the short paper that's on the syllabus. It's due about halfway through the semester. And as you can see, this is the same length. It's three to five pages. So no big paper. Your big thing at the end is the group contract. Good question though. I'm glad you asked. Um, so that is there. Feel free to laugh or not, <laughs> depending on how kind you're feeling. Um, I'll post your group assignments once we have them there. Uh, and then there will be additional materials once you guys are prepared. Like this is the last time, but you could see how I post them where I posted people's PowerPoints, their handout and their article for the group projects. Um, and then there are PowerPoints, but I think I mentioned this last week, they're just the ones from the textbook. So traditionally what I do when I prep a course is I take the ones from the textbook and I kind of like finagle them, borrow things here or there. And this course, I just decided I didn't want to bore you by making you stare at PowerPoints the whole time. So they're here for your reference. Some people find them more helpful than uh, others. And there will be a couple of times I refer to them, like certain tables and things like that. Um, but yeah, other than that, when you we've made your groups, I will use the group function and then you all can communicate over Blackboard if you want. You don't have to use it. Uh, but that is that. So let me exit the preview and I will get us to our links and videos again. And I pulled up the SGA so that everybody can follow along. And I just realized if I'm going to be accessible, I got to put on the captions. All righty. I try to be good about that, but sometimes I forget. Uh, so, what is clinical neuropsychology? For anyone who got the chance, I think about seven of you got the chance to do the first SGA, or if you all just have guesses. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that's psychology in general, but more specifically, clinical neuropsych, right? And so we're relating behavior, emotions, and thoughts to the brain, basically. And that's what makes clinical neuropsych special. And the clinical part is really the applied piece, right? That we're going to be assessing people and trying to help them who have disorders related to the brain. Um, excellent. Excellent. And clinical neuropsychology has a goal, which is to understand human behavior as it relates to the function of the brave, the brain. The brain can be brave, I guess. <laughs> um, and so the academic side of this is learning not only about the disorders, but also about normal brain functioning by studying the disorders. So for example, to take us way back in time, and we'll talk about this when we get to frontal lobes, but Phineas Gage, the guy who was like doing the railroad spike and it went, I think a lot of people, I was the same way, I thought it just got stuck in his head, but it actually went all the way through. Um, and it damaged his frontal lobes. And based on the damage and what happened to him, we started to figure out, oh, the frontal lobes have to do with emotion and personality. And so a lot of what we learn about normal functioning is from people who've had those parts of the brain damaged. 
Um, and so we studied the brain as it relates to behavior, emotions, and also to these particular disorders. So we're gonna be looking at how brain change influences behavior. And so in an interesting way, that makes this field multidisciplinary. So it's not, it's not gonna feel the same way as if you've taken like a Africana studies or a gender women sexuality studies course here, but it is gonna incorporate stuff from biology, chemistry, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, even philosophy. And the last in particular is difficult to divorce from psychology in general, as the science of psychology grew out of philosophy. Psychology in general and neuropsychology in particular go out and test things that philosophers philosophize <laughs> and uh, don't necessarily have the techniques to be able to test themselves. And so the cool thing is with the stuff like the brain scans, which you read about for today, we're starting to able to see stuff in real time. Other disciplines that are related, neurology, which is a medical subfield, uh, and then really cognitive psychology, which is what Dr. Ariel does, uh, relates in terms of both the theory and the research. And in fact, there's a subfield within neuropsychology, just like there's clinical neuropsychology, there's actually cognitive neuropsychology. And I took a whole course in that as a grad student. I was actually really interested in this, like, Fun little anecdote. Um, so I took that course at the same time as I took my neuropsychological assessment class where we learned about the various assessments and how to do them. And uh, it's just different worlds. <laughs> so cognitive neuropsychology is trying to figure out more the function. And they're sort of figuring out abstractly and theorizing, okay, so this must be related to this, related to this, related to this. So they come up with these idea of like nodes in the mind. But then if you ask, like, where is that in the brain? I can't always tell you. <laughs> and so going from that to, you know, something that was like very clearly related, it was like ooh, a little mind boggling, but also helpful to kind of see the two perspectives. Uh, so yeah, just make sure you're looking through um, the stuff that's in your books about the brain areas and brain dysfunctions, those will come up again as we go out throughout the semester. Um, and in terms of this, we know that clinical neuropsychology and neuropsychology as a general field are gonna interact, right? The research side is gonna inform the clinical side and sometimes the research itself is clinic. So I'll give you an example, the one neuropsych publication I have, um, we did a research study where we had older adults come in, they did some physical tests, uh, and then we did some memory tests on them. And uh, then we compared, and we also did like some blood drops. And we looked at letter, levels of what's called an amyloid beta. Um, and amyloid beta is related to Alzheimer's and other dementias. And in fact, if you learned about Alzheimer's and heard the term amyloid flax, those are made from amyloid beta, which builds up in the brain and people with this type of dementia and isn't cleared out. And that gunk in the brain is part of what causes the dementia. Um, and so even though it was experimental, right, it was research, what we were doing wasn't that dissimilar to what we would have done if someone came to us and said, I'm having memory problems, we would have given them the same test. So it's sort of interesting there. Um, <laughs> back in the day, you can, you actually had some uh, research with single cells. <laughs> um, oftentimes the single cell they used initially is the neuron of a squid. Because uh, they're like this thing. <laughs> the neuron, not the squid, the neuron. It's like of the giant squid. Uh, whereas our neurons, we can't even see with the naked eye, right? So it allows us to see those mechanisms, um, but obviously not efficient way <laughs> to study the human brain. 
but it's how we get basic science going. You can do this uh, with live animals where you insert an electrode into the brain adjacent to a particular neuron and record that neuron's activity. In modern technology actually allows many individual neurons to be recorded simultaneously. Um, and historically these have been used and really it's used more in research than in diagnosis. Although maybe we'll get there at some point in the future. One thing I realized I skipped over is uh, what a neuropsychologist actually does. It's a lot of assessment. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting because uh, people sort of like poo poo the idea of assessment in general, or they don't know what it is in psychology. And it's a lot of what we do in a lot of subfields of psychology. If you want to be a neuropsychologist, a forensic psychologist, even a clinical psychologist, a decent amount of your time, if not all your time, will be taken up preparing, giving, scoring, and interpreting assessments. And clinical neuropsych is no different. So in terms of their workplace, they can work in a university. That's where my uh, clinical neuropsych professor worked. Um, but they can also work in inpatient or outpatient clinical settings. Uh, sometimes they will be housed in neurology departments, psychiatry departments, or rehabilitation departments. You can also have a private practice. So if anyone um, takes Pleasure House, when you go to the uh, to Chick's Beach, on the left-hand side as you're heading out there, there's a neuropsychological associates or something like that. Um, and that would be an example of a private practice. Uh, they can and often do research and well. They're involved in diagnosis and assessment and sometimes in treatment as well. And each person they see can be different. They tailor their assessment strategy to the person coming in and the types of things they think are going wrong. They're usually involved in interdisciplinary teams. So what this means is that they're working with people from other fields. So at the VA, for example, there were neuropsychologists or people doing neuropsychology on the spinal cord injury unit. So that was both inpatient and outpatient, working with people who had, um, you know, anywhere from just trouble walking to no movement below the neck, that type of thing. Um, they worked in medical rehab, so people who have had heart attacks, hip replacements, things along those lines, uh, traumatic brain injury. I got to work on this interdisciplinary team when I was a resident, and it was really cool. So it was the neurologist, a uh, neurology nurse, a uh, neurology social worker, and then me as sort of the neuropsychologist in training. And we all met with the patient together and observe the physical exam together. And then I would take the patient into a side room and do some screening measures for memory, attention, that type of thing. And then we'd come back together and discuss the patient. And so it was a really collaborative and informed way to do their medical care. Also, we would do it on the PTSD unit. If you have PTSD because you got hit by an improvised explosive device, right, or your vehicle bid, you might also have a brain injury, right? And unfortunately, traumatic brain injury or TBI is the signature injury of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, what they call Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom, OBF, OIF, you'll hear it abbreviated. And so a lot of folks um, are dealing with both, right? Um, and then you try to do a holistic assessment and collaborate to get the best overall treatment plan for that particular person. Neuropsychologists can also be forensic neuropsychologists and they would be people who either in private practice or perhaps on a consultancy basis every once in a while would do assessments for people let's say after an accident, let's say you've been in a car accident and it was because a tractor trailer 
crash into your car and you got a head injury, right? And you're suing them for X amount of money. Well, a neuropsychologist might be called in to assess which levels of functioning, which areas of functioning you no longer can do. And then that starts to justify your lawsuit, right? They can also be called as expert witnesses about research on neuropsychology um, or as witnesses based on those assessments that they perform. Alrighty, so that gives you like a little overview of the who, the what, the where, <laughs> what um, neuropsychologists do. And so now we're going to start talking about uh, neural scans, brain imaging. Um, and one thing I'll say just from the get-go, your book covers this. I like to talk about it because certainly as a neuropsychologist, these are things you would look at. But as a neuropsychologist, you would not be the one to do these. Um, these are typically done either by MDs, but in the large amount of situations by techs who are trained to do this. this. Just like when you get an x-ray, it's typically an x-ray tech who takes you back and does the x-ray, right? Um, so the neuropsychologist would not be the person operating the MRI or whatever kind that could be, but they might consult with the neurologist or radiologist about the results. And most neuropsychologists who are trained at least know the rudimentary fundamentals of how does this work. And so before we dive into the first type that's used on people pretty frequently, EEG, I wanted to show you a little bit about research on single cells. And so this is um, a robot <laughs> that will actually analyze single single cells. It's time to improve your writing game with Grammarly it's Go. Not Grammarly Go is an AI <laughs> service that offers- The brain is a complex circuit made out of hundreds of billions of cells called neurons, each of which communicates with thousands of others. Each neuron receives information from upstream neurons, computes an electrical signal within it in milliseconds, then triggers the transmission of information to downstream neurons. These neurons are heterogeneous. They express many different sets of genes and have many different shapes, and they change in different ways in different brain disorders. In order to understand how neurons compute, ideally one would be able to observe individual neurons processing electrical signals in the living mammalian brain. And ideally, one could derive a complete list of the different types of neurons that make up the brain. By seeing how each type of neuron changes in a given brain disorder, one could identify molecules that distinguish unhealthy cells from healthy ones, which could then serve as better targets for novel drugs that have fewer side effects. A team of mechanical engineers, neuroengineers, and neuroscientists has now developed a robot that can analyze the electrical and molecular properties of single cells in the living mammalian brain. And so you, here you can see that even in research, the team is multidisciplinary, right? You've got engineers, you've got medical doctors, probably neuropsychologists as well, all working together to do this. Um, also, full disclosure that a lot of our work on neuropsychology in things like this comes from animals. And I know that people have very mixed feelings about animal testing. Um, even though I acknowledge that we've gained a lot of knowledge from animal testing over the years that we couldn't get, uh, some of this feels, makes me feel squeamish, to be perfectly honest. Like, you'll see they're going to be putting a probe inside this rat's brain and there were people at my grad school who like attached things to the rats and the rats just always had on their brain from them. And they would just run around with these wires coming out of their head. And I remember one time, and some of you have heard this story before, um, but we got an old department email and it was like, if you see a rat, it's not an infestation, it got away. And all the clinical people were like, go little rat, go. Because <laughs> uh, typically when a study is done, you just euthanize the animal. Um, because often you can't use them for another experiment. So just, I realized I should have given that caveat before we dove into this video. The robot consists of a glass micro needle known as a pipette with a tip just a micron wide and filled with electrically conductive fluid. The pipette tip can be moved around by a precision motor. The robot docks the pipette to a single cell in the living brain 
so that the pipette can capture electrical signals and molecules from the cell. The electrical signals are transmitted up the pipette, amplified, and sent to a computer. The molecules can be harvested by extracting the contents of the pipette. The procedure of using pipettes to record neural activity, known as patch clamping, has been performed by humans for decades. But in the living brain, it is difficult to do, something of an art form that only a small number of people have mastered. This robot is controlled, in contrast, by an algorithm, a piece of software that enables neurons to be detected, electrically recorded, and molecularly harvested in a high-throughput fashion without requiring human intervention. The robot lowers the pipette into the brain, looking for a cell to record from. Pressure is applied to the inside of the pipette so that it constantly ejects a small amount of liquid to keep the tip clean. It detects cells by delivering small pulses of electricity while the pipette is lowered in small steps, each about a thousandth of a millimeter long. When no neuron is present, the pulses of electricity diffuse away into the brain. When the pipette is close to a neuron, however, the neuron blockades the flow of electricity. The software running the robot monitors these electrical signals over time. This software, in essence, equips the robot with a bit of intelligence, enabling it effectively to see a cell when it is nearby. When it detects the blockade of the flow of electricity, indicating a neuron to be present, the robot halts the motion of the pipette. Then the robot applies a bit of suction to the cell, bringing the cell's membrane or boundary in close contact with the pipette tip. This is crucial because it is important to ensure that the pipette and the cell are touching closely. Finally, a brief pulse of suction results in the rupturing of the cell membrane, enabling the inside of the cell to be connected to the inside of the pipette. Now, electrical activity within the cell can be recorded with extraordinary precision. Also, if a dye is contained in the pipette, it can diffuse into the cell, enabling the shape of the cell, an important determinant of how a cell computes, to be seen. And because the pipette has access to the inside of the cell, it can harvest the contents of the cell body, which can be pulled into the pipette with a bit of suction. In this way, the robot can perform many kinds of observation, electrical, molecular, and morphological on single cells embedded within the intact brain. Robotics has had a huge impact on biology. And so you can see that, and we're not going to be doing this to a living human, probably anytime soon, right? But it does a lot of the study. Another reason I really like this video and other ones we'll see a lot again throughout the semester is that more often, especially at the intro level, there is a little cross section of the neuron, right? And it's really flat. Um, and what you'll see is that it's actually very 3D. And this is the cell body, the nucleus is in here. It is kind of right, right? Um, you see it because cool. that's the cross section we look at. I also like how it shows that all of the axons and uh, the different branches are all intertwined, right? And that one neuron doesn't just connect to one other neuron. They're often to a whole bunch of different ones. Um, so the nervous system is actually much more complex than we typically think that it is. So again, that gives you a little bit of an indication of what this is. Okay, so then the first like exterior, let's actually look at human brains. Brain technique we came up with was EEG or electroencephalogram. And so this is very similar to the EKG for the heart. Okay, but it's for the brain. Uh, and it was discovered or developed by a guy named Hans Berger in the 1930s. And they record electrical potentials or basically brain waves. Um, and so the neurons generate this signal, kind of similar to what we just saw. Um, but instead of looking at one neuron, you're kind of looking all over. Now, it used to be if you wanted to do an EEG, you had to like shave your head and like attach these things all over. Uh, there are different annotations now where you don't have to do that, where like there might be cap that can go through your hair, things along those lines. So this makes it even less invasive. EEG is most commonly used for sleep studies, uh, monitoring people when they're in under anesthesia. 
and studying normal brain functioning. And so this is oops, a video on just the basics of how we do EEG. One of these days. So we'll just open normally. A new Planet Fitness is now oh, we get Planet and Fitness and ads too. Never seen one of those before. <laughs> We're talking to clean this series of instructional videos will help you to understand some of the basics of the collection process that we use. In the lab, we implement a number of methods to evaluate the brain and its underlying neurophysiology. Today, we will be learning a little bit about electroencephalography, also known as EEG. I love the happening in music. EEG measures the summation of electrical activity on the scalp, primarily derived from postsynaptic activity around the dendrites of pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex. So these are the four lobes of the brain. We're gonna cover these more in depth next week, but frontal and occipital are really easy to remember. Frontal's in the front, occipital is your vision, it's in the back, and then parietal's up here, temporal is by your ears. Neurons communicate by passing an electrical signal by the movement of ions flowing in and out of the cell. First, electrical signals are transmitted from the dendrites to the cell membrane where they meet the axon hill. And again, remember, this is that 3D structure we just looked at, but in a cross section. Here, the summation of all these charges is used by the axon hillock, which is the gatekeeper of the neuron, to decide whether or not the signal should be passed on to the axon terminal. So that's an action potential, if you remember back to intro psych. Okay, that's, the message goes down electrically. The axon hillock is the point where the summation of excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials meet. If the summation of these potentials reaches the threshold, the signal passes. The neuron has a resting membrane potential of about negative 70 millivolts. Voltage-gated sodium channels will open when the membrane potential becomes more positive or depolarizes. When this occurs, the sodium rushes into the cell, transmitting the depolarization down the axon. This occurrence is called an action potential. However, a single electrical event isn't big enough to be detected by EEG, and action potentials can cancel each other out. Enter the pyramidal neuron. Pyramidal neurons are found in the most superficial layers of the brain and are spatially aligned. Thus, their activity is synchronous, which produces a larger signal that can be measured superficially from the scalp. Axons from neighboring neurons synapse with the pyramidal neurons. Chemically gated ions on the postsynaptic membrane open in response to increased concentration of neurotransmitters that bind to the proteins. However, when the depolarization begins at one end of the neuron, the other end repolarizes back to negative 70 millivolts, thus creating a dipole of the neuron and conducting a current. It is important to remember that regardless of whether an action potential is reached or not, all postsynaptic potentials will contribute to the EEG signal. Every postsynaptic potential causes the charge inside the neuron to change and the charge outside the neuron to change in opposition. The summation of the dipoles created by hundreds to thousands of neurons is what is detected by the EEG. Hopefully this video gave you an introduction to EEG methods and how- So that gives you a basic understanding of what you're trying to read when you're using an EEG. Um, what EEG lets us do, as you kind of got from that, is just look at brain waves, right? And you can kind of, with modern EEG, start to get some locations, but as you can see, there are multiple, multiple neurons firing at once, so that makes it a little harder. Um, so EEG can be used to diagnose epilepsy. Um, and it can also provide information about sort of cause of problems in examining cognitive functioning. 
Uh, there's also something uh, called MEG or MEG uh, that does something similar, but records magnetic fields instead of electrical pulses. Uh, and that does permit 3D localization of the cell groups. And I thought, yep, here we go. It's like, I know I have a video on Meg. It's just out of order. So this will give you a little bit of an indicator of what that looks like. Again, this can also be used to diagnose epilepsy. Hello, welcome to the Aspen Brain Center. My name's Caroline. This is Stefano, who's the consultant, and this is Elaine. Today we're going to take you through all the steps that will happen when you come to your MEG scan. So Stefano is going to be our volunteer today and the first thing we'll notice about Stefano is that he has taken off anything that was on his body that might contain metal. So he's not wearing his watch, he's not wearing his belt, he's not wearing his glasses and he's also taken his shoes off because your shoes can contain small bits of metal as well. This is really important because if you're wearing any metal when you go into the MEG system it won't work properly. So the next step uh, is for us to We'll also talk about that when we talk about MRI. Um, it, this makes doing these tricky or sometimes impossible if you have metal embedded in your body. So if you have a screw in your knee or a pacemaker, a lot of times they will not do a MEG or an MRI on you. To attach these five little coils to Stefano's forehead. They're very small and we just attach them with tape. Three of them go across the top of his forehead there and one behind each ear. So you can see... Um, so again, you can see much less invasive than back in the day when you had to shave your head to do this type of thing. Put this on just with sticky tape like that. So it's very easy to take off after we're finished. Okay, so here goes the first one. There we go. And I'm going to pop that down behind your ear. You can see that we've now attached the five coils to Stefano, three on his forehead and then one behind each ear. And the next step for us is to ask Stefano to wear these goggles. So the goggles are an important part of the next step that we're going to do. And the other thing we need is this, which is a special tool that we use to measure the position of Stefano's head and the position of all those little coils that we've just stuck on. Um, so first of all, I'm going to measure the position of Stefano's nose. Here we go, it's the bridge of his nose. There we go, and the beep means that the computer is recording it. And his ears. One. Two, good. Now I'm going to do the same for all his coils. Here we go. One. Two. We've now finished the process of measuring the shape of Stefano's head, and that information goes from this pen to the computer. And we use this to find out whereabouts in the brain the seizures are coming from. Now we're all finished with our preparations, and it's time to take Stefano through into the MEG scanner. The MEG scanner is inside this room. So I'm going to take Stefano through, I'm going to ask him to take a seat in our chair, and then I'm going to slowly lift him up so that his head is inside the MEG scanner. The camera is not allowed in this room because it's made of metal, but hopefully you can see what we're going to do next. First of all, I'm going to plug Stefano's coils that we stuck on earlier into the MEG system. And then I'm going to raise Stefano up in his chair so that his head is inside this helmet here. Okay, I'm happy with that. His head is in the right position now, so we're ready to record. During the MEG recording, you'll be able to watch a DVD to keep yourself occupied. We're going to close the door on you, but if you don't want to be in here on your own, someone can sit in here with you to keep you company. They just need to remove all their metal from their body in the same way that you did before we came in. 
once we're underway, you'll be able to talk to us through a microphone so we can hear you and we can see you on a video camera as well. So you never really are on your own in here anyway. I'm going to close the door now. It makes a bit of a funny noise. And now we're ready to do our recording. We're back over at the desk now, and from here we can talk to Stefano through this intercom, and we can see him on this video screen. Give us a wave, Stefano. Good. And on this computer over here, Elaine is recording Stefano's brain activity. And it's this recording that we can use to find out more about where in your brain your seizures may be coming from. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what will happen when you... Yeah, I like a lot of these videos that were made for patients because they explain it in a very like approachable way and walk you through everything. Um, because if you've never had one of these, it can be pretty scary. Uh, to be like, you're going to put my head in what? A giant magnet? <laughs> and so you always want to try to um, increase the comfort of the patient as much as you can. Um, and so prior to development of these types of things, we used to be able to only use x-rays or post-mortem autopsies, basically, to study what was going on with the brain. And unfortunately, there are still some diseases that we can only study post-mortem. One of those is CPT, um, which is the brain disorder associated with multiple, multiple concussions that a lot of NFL players have been getting, although we're starting to see it in um, uh, international football soccer as well uh, from all the headers. Um, and unfortunately, it's not detectable on any of our brain scans. And so the only way to get a concrete diagnosis is to examine the brain post-mortem. And in fact, sadly, there have been NFL players who have died by suicide and who shoot themselves through the chest and leave notes like, please study my brain, um, which is just like heartbreaking, right? So hopefully we'll get to the point where we can study this more and we can diagnose it and treat it when the person's alive, right? Um, so x-rays are still sometimes used, right? Uh, and what happens there is you pass the x-rays through whatever part of the body you're x-raying and then onto x-ray sensitive film uh, and different types of tissue absorb the rays differently so you'll see the bones differently than the soft tissue around it for example one of the biggest steps up that we had from EEG and from just x-rays is the ct or cat scan uh, which stands for computerized tomography. And this uses x-ray technology, but in a very different way. So instead of just one image or maybe changing the image, the position alone, doing a second image, it uses multiple x-rays through the brain at different angles uh, and then puts those together to create a 3D image of the brain. This is not that precise. It doesn't give you the level of detail that some of the other scans we'll talk about will do. Um, but it does allow us to look at the brain overall and we can see things like the ventricles and the major fissures. Um, and we can also see if there are things like a bleed in the brain or a tumor in the brain on something like a CT scan. So open these. some of the other ones all right ct scans are a high-tech marvel allowing unprecedented diagnostic capability the scans were first utilized in the mid-1990s to examine the seriously ill but the use has expanded exponentially since uh fun fact about the cat scan is it won the nobel prize for medicine in 2003 Thanks to persuasive advertising at some medical facilities, CAT or CT scans are being touted as preventive health measures for symptom-free individuals. Are they worth the risks and the costs? CT stands for computerized tomography. These interior maps are created with a powerful x-ray source that scans a body in a spiral from head to toe. Computer programs compile the data into a three-dimensional, highly detailed image. Scientists who use the process are proud of its ability to detect hidden disease. The imaging tool uh, can provide uh, 
information that a simple physical exam uh, cannot. Coronary artery disease, the largest single killer in our society, can be detected quite sensitively with uh, a um, CT scan that looks at calcium in the coronary arteries. We can detect uh, a variety of uh, cancers in various organs. For overtly healthy patients, the scans are not covered by insurance, and they are expensive, ranging from $300 for a look at your heart to $800 and up to peer at your entire body. And those are old numbers. They would be in the thousands today. <laughs> for some, CT scans could also be hazardous. Whether or not that low dose of uh, radiation from that chest CT scan produces cancer or not is simply unknown. Carolisa Pomerantz is the associate producer of the documentary Reverse Aging Now. While investigating CT scans for inclusion in that feature, she volunteered for a scan herself. Although middle-aged, Carolisa keeps fit, watches her weight, and had every expectation of normal results. She was wrong. Two of Carolisa's coronary arteries had narrowed. There are approximately 16% of women your age who have more calcification than you. Yes, I'm very concerned. Um, I just uh, can't think it's an emergency. They didn't rush me away. What causes heart artery? And so there you can see the types of things it can detect. Um, it is a lower um, fidelity. Uh, it's like more pixelated, essentially, than some of these other scans. Uh, this is a CT scan uh, of somebody who has a tumor. Um, there, that's their tumor there. Um, so uh, you are able to detect something large like that. And this is working its way through the different layers of the brain, which again is something we used to do, um, but by actually cutting the brain into slices post-mortem, this, this moves us forward, right? Um, so it's a good tool, but it's not perfect. Uh, there are other tools that have improved things. Um, one is the PET or PET scan. Um, and this stands for positron emission tomography. For all of these, y'all just need to know the abbreviations. Um, and it basically here you get an injection of radioactive molecules, uh, or you could also inhale them. And then those release particles that can be detected by the PET scanner. Uh, and a computer reconstructs variations in the density and the flow. Again, they're in your blood, so it's essentially measuring blood flow throughout the brain. Uh, and modern PET cameras or PET cameras obtain multiple parallel brain slices. Um, and PET is not measuring neural activity in the same way that you know when we looked at the single neuron. Uh, that was measuring electricity. Instead, it infers neural activity through the assumption that blood flow increases in areas where there's more neural activity. So it, it has the advantage that um, it can detect relative amounts of a neurotransmitter, the density of receptors on uh, neurons, they can look at degenerative processes um, and also metabolic activities that happen when you're doing a task. Um, it's widely used to study cognitive function. So while someone's doing something, however, the indirect measurement does make it a weakness. And some people argue that increased blood flow doesn't always mean increased neural activity. So that's an inherent flaw. And this is, again, a patient this go about that is a This is killer. not it. This is a metabolism killer. And even this. Just side note, hopefully all of you know, don't trust some random bro or, or person on the internet to tell you about your own nutrition. Work with your doctor. <laughs> PET scans are being used more and more frequently as a diagnostic imaging tool for a wide variety of conditions. We'd like to provide you with an overview of this painless state-of-the-art procedure in the event your physician requests a PET scan to help evaluate your health. 
PET stands for positron emission tomography and is similar to a CT or computed tomography scan. Like the CT scan, you'll be asked to lie on a table, which will gently move you into an enclosed imaging device that looks like a donut. However, PET is different than CT in that it does not use x-rays. Josie, both CT and PET are um, not entirely open, but you can like see much more clearly they're not that big of a tunnel. MRI is different. For your PET scan, you will be injected intravenously with a small amount of radioactive tracer containing glucose. The low level radiation associated with this tracer is similar to the radiation you would receive during a standard x-ray or CT scan. Glucose is the principal circulating sugar in your blood and the major energy source for your body. Every cell in your body requires it, making it an excellent substance for this diagnostic exam. The physician uses PET scan imaging to follow the tracer labeled glucose as it travels through your body. Some cells, such as infections or tumors, use more glucose than others. This allows the PET camera to see where any abnormal cells are. You should not eat or drink anything for four to six hours before arriving for your scan. If you normally take medications, you can continue taking them with a small amount of water. Some facilities will ask you to drink eight glasses of water the day before the exam. You may also be asked to drink two glasses of water before arriving at the facility. Let the scheduler know if your doctor has restricted your fluid intake. You would want to limit your physical activity for 24 hours before the exam. Some pet studies may require you- Basically to all those things are just trying to get a good baseline, essentially. To eat a special meal the evening before the exam. The scheduler will let you know what, if any, meal requirements you might have. You'll want to wear comfortable clothing to the facility. If you have a prior CT, MR, X-ray, or nuclear medicine study, you might be asked to bring copies with you the day of your exam. When you arrive in the department, you will be asked for a brief medical history, including any medication you might be taking. You might also be asked questions about your ability to lie still or to put your arms over your head. Female patients will be asked about the possibility of pregnancy or if they're currently breastfeeding. If you're claustrophobic or overly anxious, you may be given medication to relax. If you take this medication, you will need someone to drive you home after the test. <laughs> Don't drive yourself home when you're drugged up on sedatives. <laughs> your blood glucose level will be checked with a small monitor similar to this one. If you're diabetic, please mention this at the time you schedule your test as additional precautions may be required. The blood glucose typically should be less than 200 in order for you to have the scan. Some tests require a higher glucose level. The facility will make that decision and will adjust your glucose level as needed. If you take insulin, be sure to administer it at least four hours before coming in for your study. You will be placed in a quiet, darkened location for your injection. It's important to lie still and rest as this will impact the uptake of glucose to various parts of your body. Once the injection is given, it will be about 30 minutes to two hours before your pictures are taken. You will be asked to empty your bladder so you and remain still and quiet it during like. this time. The table will quietly move periodically during the test. You should not experience any discomfort. The pictures the camera takes will measure the amount of radiation being put out by the tracer that was injected into your body. You should not hear any loud noises during the exam. There will be a technologist near you at all times who can address any questions or concerns you might have. The equipment may also have a CT scanner in it, so you may also have a CT scan at the same time. So there are combo ones, um, which obviously saves time and money. Um, and so the last one that I want to talk about, and then we'll look at some comparisons of these types of scans, is the MRI or the magnetic resonance imaging. So similar to the MEG, this is just a giant magnet. Um, there was a sort of infamous episode of House uh, where someone had, I think, a bullet in them, and they were worried about will this like get sucked out and mess something up. So they, this is TV, they get corpse and they shot it. 
and I put it in an MRI and it did get sucked out. Uh, and my understanding is that like, it wouldn't get sucked out, but it would move around in your tissue, right? So imagine you have a pacemaker and that's moving around in your tissue. That's not gonna, right? And so this is why they check. And this is also why, let's say you're brought in unconscious with no one who knows you, um, they won't do an MRI until they have some sort of medical record because they can't assume you don't have them. Um, so instead they would do a CT or one of these other scans. Uh, and so it's a large magnet and a specific radio frequency pulse to generate a brain signal that produces an image. Um, and you lay in this long metal cylinder. So this one is more claustrophobic for folks. Um, and you have to lie as still as possible. And people have tried ways to like help people calm down more. So not only sedating them, but some places will let you, you know, again, depending on where they need to be measuring you, wear headphones, like noise canceling headphones, or uh, listen to music, that type of thing. Um, and so I have an MRI video that we'll kind of skip through, and then we'll talk about functional or fMRI. How to open your car door when you're trapped underwater. A lethal design flaw in all recent cars. Welcome to this MRI patient education videotape. Your physician has ordered an MRI medication condition. What is MRI? MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And for the next few minutes, we'll discuss the MRI examination. You'll see some of the remarkable images produced by this type of medical imaging exam. These are MR images of the brain. They're astoundingly clear and detailed. So they're much clearer than a CT. Um, you can also, some MRIs will colorize them so that any sort of tumor will stand out a lot more. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know exactly. It'd be a good Google. Um, but essentially, I think what's happening is like the magnet and various other things are moving around inside the tube. And that's what makes the various different sounds. Uh, but yeah, I, apparently I haven't had an MRI, but apparently like that's the most terrifying part. It's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh no. Oh my gosh. That's a good question. Um, So our dizziness is related to our inner ear, which obviously related to sound. Um. So if it's hitting just right and vibrating sort of around your cochlea, that could make you really dizzy, right? And so in different, just like our fingerprints are different, you know, our uh, leg lengths are different, like our ears might be slightly differently shaped to where that would affect you, but maybe not somebody else. But yeah, these are why, um, and you saw this with the other scan, it's so important that there's a mic in there so you can tell them things like that, right? Like, oh, hey, I'm dizzy. Oh. <laughs> Um, I have a question because uh, I've actually had both back to back where mm -hmm. it's with and without contrast. Yep. Yep. What does the contrast actually do? Because I actually got a reaction. Yeah. A few people are just like any other medication. Some people are allergic to the contrast, which isn't great. Um, basically, it allows for different images that they can make their pair. So the contrast is like a dye they put in you. And so they can compare the one with to the one without, and then you'll see, um, you know, more clearly what they're trying to look at. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just like anything else, like some people, antibiotics or allergy meds, they have weird reactions to that can happen with dyes or things along those lines. So certainly, if you've had that, make sure you tell the doctor if you ever got to have to have another one. I just thought it was weird. Because I was like, it's the same procedure, but it's right? the right. contrast, and it was like, um back to back so it's like yeah exactly yeah and sometimes they'll do it like while you're still laying on the same table they won't have you get up or anything they're just like okay here it comes so yeah really good question but again you can see just from the other ones we've looked at just how much more precise this is here in addition to the brain we can see the spinal cord sinuses teeth and even the blood vessels just what makes MRI so different from other medical imaging techniques, such as conventional x-rays and computed tomography? 
known as CT scans. And under what circumstances is MRI the preferred imaging technique? Let's see. X-ray devices are generally used to take projection images of hard tissues like bones. CT scans take images of both hard bony tissues and soft tissue, such as the brain. Both X-ray and CT systems use X-ray beams, which travel through the body and project an image onto a photographic film or display it on a video monitor. MRI and so like the most common X-ray most people get are the bite wings at the dentist, right? And what they what's on the bite wing is the film, basically. And so, or unless like my dentist has now upgraded to, there's like a digital thing that reads it. Um, so they're not using film anymore. It's like a sensor that reads it like the film. And then it just goes right to the computer, which is really cool because I can just see them pull up as I go. Um, but like that, just to give you some context, if you've ever had an x-ray for other reasons, that's what you're doing when you're doing bite wings. MRI, on the other hand, works differently. MRI uses a magnetic field to orient the position of certain nuclei in the body. The primary nuclei used for MRI imaging is in the hydrogen atom, called a proton. As you know, the body is made up of approximately 75% water. And so here again, you can see the chemistry and the physics that come in and how this is an interdisciplinary field. Water is two parts hydrogen, making the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, the proton, the most abundant in the human body. A radio wave is then used to excite the proton, which resonate and emit varying signals, which are received, digitized, and displayed as images. Different signals emitted by different body tissues are then used to differentiate individual anatomy. When tissue is damaged, its composition changes and gives off an uncharacteristic signal. So when displayed, that damaged tissue is distinguishable from surrounding healthy oh. tissue. The little black spot there. It's important to point out that MRI utilizes magnetic fields and radio waves. Patients are not exposed to x-rays or other ionizing radiation. On the day of your examination, it's a good idea to arrive- I'm going to skip all the pre-stuff here. Of contrast ...to enhance the distinction between certain tissues. Yeah, there we go. That's what I said. So doing with and without contrast lets you look more closely at especially certain soft tissues. This contrast is specific for MR imaging and is different from that used for CT and X-ray examinations. The need for this contrast will depend on the type of MR exam your physician has prescribed. The MRI exam generally takes between 20 minutes and one hour. During this time, a series of images will be taken. Each set of images requires several minutes to complete. An intercom system keeps you in two-way communication with the trained medical professional performing your exam, the MRI technologist. <laughs> it is very Great important acting. that you remain still while the <laughs> images are being acquired. You'll know that an image is being acquired when you hear a knocking sound. You may relax when the machine is not making the knocking sound, but you must remain in the initial position unless you are instructed otherwise. If you move during the procedure, it may be necessary to repeat the exam. Although the MRI exam is painless, it does require you to remain still until the exam is complete. Patients often try to nap. Mr. Smith enjoys golfing a lot. Perhaps he's thinking about his favorite course, concentrating on how relaxed he feels when he's playing. Think about something you enjoy doing. Oh, gotta love it. We never said medical professionals were the best filmmakers, right? That's fine. <laughs> um, so fMRI or functional MRI uh, can be used diagnostically, but um, is often used in research. So this, instead of taking still pictures, takes essentially like videos or GIFs <laughs> or GIFs, however you pronounce that, of the brain. Um, and it can display changes in neural activity. It has high spatial resolution, um, but it can be very expensive for folks. Um, and, and this is why this research is somewhat problematic. So oftentimes fMRI research will only have say 20 people in the study. And it's because whenever you're using one of these machines and you're having a patient who for medical reasons, you essentially have to pay what the insurance would pay to use the machine. 
Um, and so that can add up pretty darn quickly, right? Given the cost of things, or you're buying your own MRI, uh, which, you know, in and of itself is millions of dollars, right? So I don't know how many millions. It might just be a million. I've never priced an MRI, so who knows? Um, but so I have uh, some cool videos on fMRI. Um, this is a uh, famous opera singer, Renee Fleming. Um, and so you are going to see her uh, doing this, looking at music in the brain. I noticed research coming out about the fact that music has been discovered to be in a lot of parts of the brain, and therefore it engages so much of us. It's an exciting time in neuroscience where we're beginning to understand how the brain interacts with the environment. And music is a really important part of the environment. And we're starting to learn ways in which music can influence all kinds of other aspects of one's brain function, and especially how we could use that information to use music therapeutically in an even more powerful way. This initiative aims to bring together communities that haven't necessarily gotten to know each other that well yet, the neuroscientists uh, and the actual composers, performers, musicians who have the full grasp of the power of music in a variety of different styles. Renee, thank you so much for coming in to do this experiment with us today. Could I give you a tour of yeah, some of the see, parts yeah, of the brain we please. might see activity in? So this is one place we'll look for activity in your scan. Um, it's the part of your brain that we call the motor cortex. It controls everything in your body. When you're singing, you're also speaking. Um, and so we're gonna look for activity in some of the parts of your brain that are important for form and speech. This one here is called Broca's area, and there's another one farther back called Wernicke's area. You know, if you have injuries in either one of these parts of the brain, then you can't form normal speech. So this is the auditory cortex. There's a spot near the middle where the information sort of starts, and then as you move outward, it's processing the information more and more. I think we're ready to get you set up in the scanner. Great. Ready to go? Yeah. All right, let's do it. We're going to start our first scan. And to like give her some credit, it's really hard to sing opera laying down. <laughs> so just putting that out there, it's really hard to sing in general laying down. <laughs> We're starting to learn ways in which music can influence all kinds of other aspects of one's brain function, and especially how we could use that information to use music therapeutically. What does the brain look like when somebody is speaking? Okay, there's certain parts that are lit up. What does it look like if they're performing music? Other parts lit up, they're using more of your brain. If we could learn from that about how to fully empower people to use that creative talent that we're all born with, but oftentimes gets kind of pushed to the side by daily activities, I think that would be pretty amazing. And maybe this project can help with that. So again, really cool partnership with the Endowment for the Arts, right? Uh, really neat uh, idea here um, in terms of looking at what the brain can do. I had one, let me see if I have it linked here. If not, I'm gonna to try to search it one more time. Yeah, there was one where they had um, Emma Thompson read uh, Shakespeare, which was really cool. So let me try if I can find it really quick. look like sometimes these videos that I've used just get pulled for whatever reason so can't seem to find it today um but I'll show you uh, another quick one here about some of the ways we do this research and so this one's going to talk about how do we study emotion with MRI we tend to take emotions for granted we are always able to feel a background level of emotion but it's like the feel of your shoes on your feet. You don't pay attention to it. So, so again, interdisciplinary, this guy is a professor of both communication and psychology, right? Are much more important in guiding our behavior and our lives and our choices 
than we give them credit for. There's a common distinction between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Emotional empathy is reading the feelings of another person. Cognitive empathy involves what their intentions are. And the fascinating thing is that we can now connect them with events in the brain. Again, happen in music. Uh, MRI <laughs> just got here uh, this spring, and we're already seeing a number of users who are very interested in taking advantage of the new technology. They have great theories and great questions, and then we here at the center are trying to give them the tools that they need to bring their research into the MRI and get their studies up and running. We showed people different kinds of uh, uh, slides. Some were sexual, some were scenic, some were unpleasant, some were unusual. We also have people posing as if they were watching an emotionally loaded slide and also regulating where they are told to pose as if they are looking at something very negative when actually they're looking at something very positive and unknown to them we filmed their facial expression and then we asked the receiver to guess the emotions that the sender is experiencing and then we and this is the type of study we've done for probably half a century at least in terms of like can you tell what emotion sounds on someone's face but now we're looking at can you tell what emotions on someone's face and where's that in the brain? Get an estimate of how close they are at guessing the sender's emotions. These things that were previously hidden are now observable and measurable, and I think they are leading to a real revolution in the social and behavioral sciences. You can so see where in the, the brain it's letting up. So back here is just the visual cortex, right? The occipital lobe. So that makes sense. You're looking at something that's going to light up and then you can see the other parts of the brain. Like this part of the frontal lobe has to do with emotion for yourself. So the we're goal using of that. this research is to look at the brain mechanisms underlying those very different kinds of judgments. So obviously it opens up a lot of possibilities for doing brain-based research. So this is, let me see, no, can't get it any bigger, but hopefully you guys don't see that up here. This gives you a whole bunch of these different uh, types of uh, brain scans that we've looked at. And so, you know, MRI, fMRI, those are the ones that give you really good quality, which is one of the reasons why you can do it, um, you know, <laughs> Can you burn them? Some of them you can, some of them you can't. Is it bulky? A lot of them are, right? So you can see how you're putting it, just like you need to buy. Um, and then what's the cost like, right? Again, if you're going to buy an MRI or buy time in an MRI, it's really pricey. Um, this is a different uh, chart that kind of compares them in different ways. And I thought this was maybe the most helpful. This gives you an indication of the, the different types of cancer. This is just an x-ray of the brain. As you can see, you could probably see if there was something really different in there, or obviously if the skull was cracked, right? But like, you're not getting much fidelity. Uh, the CT gives you a little bit more. Uh, the PET is giving you that blood flow. And then the MRI. Uh, is much more detailed and then the MRA, I'm forgetting what that stands for, but it's basically looking directly at blood flow because these are the blood vessels throughout the brain. So again, these are things neuropsychologists would look at. They wouldn't do the tests themselves, uh, but by collaborating with neurologists and radiologists who do order and do these things, um, they are able to really uh, start to narrow down on what's going on. And then what we'll talk about on Wednesday is then what does the neuropsychologist do with the person in front of them? Um, and that is they do a whole series of tests to see what types of functioning are actually affected. All righty, we got through everything. Woohoo, I'm never sure how it's going to go. Uh, so I'll hang around for a couple of minutes in case anyone has questions.
Hey, quick question. Sure. So for the master programs, is there like, I know obviously there, there is, but when is the like specific time I need to? Oh, that's a good question. Them? So the biggest thing for that is to look at the programs you're going to yeah. apply to because they'll differ. The earliest one for masters that I've seen are December. Okay. I thought Oftentimes the started. other ones will be okay. no. like March. Some of them will okay. be later because they kind of like wait and see who doesn't get into PhD okay. programs, but it won't hurt to just like get them all in November if some okay. of yours are, or, or, sorry, December if some of yours are December. Anyway. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Are you actually in the Blackboard and everything now? Sweet. Yeah, if you can before class, they'll help you like when I throw questions to the class. Um, but if you need to finish them after class, that's fine. I was just mentioning them because I worked ten hours Saturday, eight hours Saturday, and Friday. Yeah, you also get, I think it's like four freebies over the course of the semester. So if you want to make this first one one of your freebies, go for it. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I plan to plan in the winter. Sure. Uh, what should we call it? Oh, something I think to what she was asking about master's programs. Mm -hmm. Should I start looking into them like within the next two months, or are they looking for like people who are in their senior year? Usually they're looking for people in their senior year, but it wouldn't hurt. You know what? I should stop recording. I mean, people can learn from this about grad school, <laughs> people about grad school. Um, <laughs>